Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you for attending um, the Friday Compass Seminar. Um, today, our speaker is Dr. Natalie Mahowald. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about Dr. Mahowald, she is the Irving Porter Church Professor of Engineering in the Earth and Atmospheric Science Department at Cornell University and the co-leader working group on reducing climate risk for Cornell Atkinson, Atkinson Center for Sustainability. Her research group is focused on understanding feedbacks in the Earth system that impact climate change. This includes global and regional scale atmospheric transport of biogeochemically important species, such as desert dust, as well as the carbon cycle. Her group looks at these issues through a combination of three-dimensional um, as three-dimensional global transport climate models, as well as analysis of satellite and in situ data. She received her PhD in meteorology from MIT, a master's of science in natural resource policy from New Michigan, and she is now a fellow of AMS, AGU, and AAAS, and has been a lead author on two IPCC reports. And so with that, I will give Dr. Mahwal the screen, and um, she today is going to be speaking to us about um, constraining atmospheric microplastics. Well, thank you very much for having me. How is my screen look? Does that look right? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, today um, I'm going to talk about something a, a little outside of what I usually work on, um, and uh, that is the atmospheric limit of the plastic cycle. And um, uh, I did this work with, with a bunch of co-authors here. Um, and it, it actually came out of phosphorus and dust work, which is my normal area. Um, so uh, Janice Brainy uh, is a watershed scientist, and she looks at the inputs, uh, atmospheric deposition inputs, um, especially into the Western United States in terms of uh, what the phosphorus and the nitrogen are doing. And, um, you know, she was taking a look at these uh, filters from the National At um, Atmospheric Deposition Program, and she noticed these weird colorful things that are obviously not dust or black carbon or something. And um, she got curious and she uh, then analyzed these at the, these 11 different stations and she had multiple time periods. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very um, difficult work because they were, you know, counting them and, and then um, double checking that they're, they were actually microplastics and um, using FTIR and, and all this really hard work. Um, but really, you know, the, the original study she was going to do was looking at dust uh, phosphorus inputs, which is more of what um, I work on, Joe, Cassie, and we work on those areas. But she had a paper um, uh, under review at Science, and she sent me this, and she said, do you, do you want to model this? <laughs> no one's ever modeled atmospheric microplastics, and um, she had an amazing amount of data. So she, she had 313 samples with size segregation of microplastics, and pretty much you know, there's 20 samples in the whole world before she, she did this. So her paper was published in Science and was really, uh, you know, insightful how much microplastics could be falling down. And so that's how I got um, sucked into this work. And um, my then postdoc, Maria Pronk, set up our model to try to accommodate these kind of funny shapes and larger um, aerosols because they're not like desert dust particles that I usually think about coming across the Atlantic or something. And so we, we were trying to figure out, well, how in the world do we, do we model something that looks like that? That's one micron thick, that's you know, maybe 200 microns long. You know, how does it fall in, in the atmosphere, especially the deposition problem? So um, you know, here again are a bunch of images of what we're trying to deal with. And of course, the, the colorful ones are obviously plastics, right? Um, or or they, they could be cotton fibers, but for the most part, they're, they're plastics. And apparently even cotton fibers um, the colors can be uh, some kind of polymer, so considered a plastic. And so these are the, the different particles that we're talking about or, or fibers. Uh, a lot of them are this fibrous material. And again, you know, we're really motivated by the study that she did looking at the Western United States here. Um, these are basically remote, you know, high elevation regions. Um, there's a lot of topography here. And she was uh, looking at both wet and dry deposition um, and had, had uh, um, you know, uh, about 18 months of data, either monthly or weekly data um, that we could use at these 11 different stations. So as I said before, the, the really important part about this in terms of trying to model it is that she had very detailed information about the um, amount of different um, length fibers um, in the dry and the wet deposition. 
And um, she found that about 2% of the deposited mass was microplastics in these remote regions. And of course, she double checked that, you know, it wasn't the person, the technician, the, the, the microplastics did not match, match the technician, you know, and these are quite remote regions that, that we're looking at here. So 2% um, might not sound like much, but uh, to me, uh, that was a lot. I, I was very surprised that microplastics could that be that large. Now, because of the way the data was taken, um, there's no data below four microns in size. Um, you just couldn't pick those out and, and go and then check with the FDIR if, if those were valid. But so that was published in Science, um, her paper. So let's think about, you know, what's going on with, with plastics and microplastics. Um, uh, you know, we all um, have heard about the, the plastics problem, especially in the ocean. But if you just think about, you know, how much plastics have increased in terms of how much generation there is and how much waste there is, that there's a lot of mismanaged plastic waste. And so there's been quite a few studies thinking about that. And, and then, of course, we, we need to think about, you know, especially in terms of macro plastics, what, what the lifetime is. And so you can think some some will last not very long in the in the in the environment, not just in the atmosphere, um, in the environment. And some will last a really a, a long time. And one can think that some of these microplastics might break down and become microplastics, or, or actually we don't really know. It could be the microplastics are actually emitted directly themselves. It really, it, that's right now a big uncertainty. There have been studies which have shown that microplastics have been observed in the Arctic, for example, um, and, and they have kind of high numbers there, although um, it was a little difficult for them to control for local contamination that, that the actual sampling didn't. Um, contaminate because, of course, wherever humans go now, we take some plastics with us. The ocean always comes up when we think about the ocean plastic problem. And, um, you know, here's a, a horrifying image, but of course, there's also that big floating um, plastics in, in the middle of the, um, the ocean um, that people have taken a look at. And of course, these are, you know, macro plastics here. So they're, they're big enough for us to easily see. Um, and, the, and the oceanographers have also taken a look at what the plastics are that are under four millimeters. Now they call these microplastics, okay? But um, maybe they're milliplastics really. I mean, um, it, you know, it's a little bit unclear and, and the, of course size matters incredibly to this, but compared to what we're gonna look at in the atmosphere, which was from four microns and up, um, this is a huge uh, particle. Um, that they were looking at, but it was what was caught in the plankton nets when they go out and, and do that. Um, and then Sybil, there were, there were several studies taking a look at the distribution of the micro, they call them microplastics, but I, I might, they're bigger than what we think are microplastics in the atmosphere. Um, and they get this kind of distribution and, um, you know, here's where the observations are and then they interpolate it to uh, this kind of distribution. So basically they're kind of accumulating in the gyre with those um, Macroplastics, but they tend to be, you know, much bigger in the Pacific, right, and in the Northern Hemisphere than in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so ocean plastics have their own special set of problems, and so there's been some really nice studies trying to take a look at how much debris there is, and and you know, one of the things is some of these trajectories suggest that you know between 2010 and 20. Um, 25, we're, we're going to go from you know something like 20 to 250. Um, in terms of million megatons of ocean plastics. And so this, this could be a, a rapidly um, increasing problem here. And it's really dependent on the mismanaged plastic fraction. That's the, the fraction that we don't sequester somehow. Um, and so I, um, our, our group had just done a study with um, Kim Prather and Gavin Cornwell on how dust particles that are de deposited into the ocean can actually be concentrated on the surface of the ocean that um, any kind of insoluble particle will um, glom onto or be, <laughs> be transported up in um, bubbles in, in the ocean. And, um, and so, and the, you know, there's often also a little uh, organic layer on the top of the ocean and so they could accumulate there. And, um, but they, they did some work in their, you know, wind wave tunnel that they have out at UCSD and argued that, you know, in the Southern Ocean, the dust particles could be coated in, in the, it could be deposited on the ocean surface, coated with this different kind of um, organic material and then resuspended. And of course that could serve as a better ice nuclei because that's what, what they were really thinking about. But we had just finished this paper with them and we're like, well, why wouldn't microplastics do the same thing? You know, there's all these microplastics in the ocean. What if they too are entrained into the little 
um, droplets that get into the atmosphere and then the droplets evaporate um, and that leaves then some aerosol in the atmosphere. So, um, so we kind of speculated that this could be a, a source and, and put it in our model. Um, and then uh, uh, another study came out um, from um, Dee and Steve Allen and some of their collaborators um, uh, when we were almost ready to submit, um, it really uh, focusing on this idea and um, they actually um, got some measurements um, here uh, and they show that when the wind is onshore, they have higher levels of microplastics than when it's offshore in their particular location, which is in, in France. Um, so, uh, so there's small amounts of um, in situ evidence that actually an ocean source could be that, you know, the ocean source that we just speculated could be happening, that, that it could be true. I, I would emphasize small amounts of data on that. Now, another potential source um, would be agricultural fields um, uh, with strong winds. So, for example, in the United States, about 55% of the biosolids produced in the US waste treatment plants. So, you know, anything coming down in the water um, is, uh, is um, in water treatment plants is um, uh, the, that, all that sludge, um, wastewater sludge that is put onto agricultural fields as, as nitrogen and you know, phosphorus or whatever fertilizer. And it turns out that about 98% of the microplastics in wastewater are retained in biosolids. So they're kind of preferentially taken up by the biosolids. Um, and uh, people have made some measurements, for example, this is in um, Ontario, Canada, of how much microplastics are in agricultural fields, and, and they're, they're there. Um, and uh, you know, in addition, people put plastic films on top of agricultural fields. And there is a study in China that says that you get higher amounts of microplastics in the field if you put plastic films on top. So again, very few studies about this, but there's you know some kind of range, huge range in terms of the concentration of the microplastics that are observed in agricultural fields. And if these are dry and during the time period when they're unvegetated and they're subject to strong winds, they could ask, act as a source of both, you know, what we might call agricultural dust, but also microplastics into the atmosphere. So we speculated that, that these could also um, be a source of microplastics to the atmosphere. The, the best documented source is, is tire and brake wear. And, um, the, there's been quite a few studies pointing this out that you know when you drive your your tires degrade and it, it gives off um, microplastic fibers um, the 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 shear forces between the tread and the pavement um, there could be some volatilization going on as well now uh, the only problem with that in terms of matching um, genesis data is that um, they're not going to be bright pink <laughs> and red okay so um, if this is a big source um, it can't it can't be from tires only. And we speculated again that it could be actually be the resuspension of existing particles at the side of the road um, as well. So that, um, that, that the movement there um, of the you know, 50 mile an hour car um, could, could pick up anything that's on the road. And so you could have colored microplastics then on the road that would be entrained in the atmosphere. Um, so we included uh, these sources. Um, and uh, right when we were, uh, uh, we were in the middle of the project, Evangelou actually did a study where they modeled just the tire brake sources um, without really any constraints from the observations. Um, and so we used their, uh, one of their data sets, which comes from Zig Clement, who's one of our co-authors. So they have an estimate of how many, um, you know, uh, how many cars went by and what the mileage was on all the different roads in, in the world. And we used that as input to our model. Now, of course, one would think that population centers would be a big source of microplastics. Um, there are studies showing high microplastic concentrations in the cities. It's unclear what the sources are, dry cleaners, laundry, incinerators, garbage. These could all be um, sources. And, and there's been some reviews, you know, just talking about all these different pathways. Um, so we also threw in population centers separately as a potential source. So uh, basically what we did was we, we looked at the Western United States um, and we uh, postulated some different sources. And then we do an optimal estimation based on the observations for the strength of those sources. So the ones that we um, uh, included in the atmospheric model were the tires and brake source from the game model. So that was from Evangelou. The ocean source, again, this is our kind of hypothetical idea. We use the spatial distribution 
of the microplastics that have been observed in Van Sibyl. Remember, their definition of microplastics is bigger than our definition, but we're just going to assume it has the same spatial distribution. And then we just have our sea spray source going in the model with that concentration overlaid on it. Then we um, uh, assume that agricultural dust could also be a source. Um, we, we use a constant concentration in all agricultural land. Um, and then we also consider the, the dust downwind of population centers. I mean, you just think like just downwind of LA, there's a bunch of dust sources. So maybe the microplastics could get deposited there and then resuspended again in the atmosphere. And we included population centers um, with population as a proxy. So we allow those to operate within the model as sources. And then um, let me, um, let's see. Let me, let me motivate this a little bit more. So from, from Janice and her colleagues' paper the, um, with the observations, they showed that the microplastics are correlated with dust. And then um, I want to know if they were correlated also with the sodium. And we only had the sodium in the wet deposition, and, and they were. But the sodium and the dust were also correlated. So I'm not, not sure that provides that much information there. They could be all the aerosols are correlated. They were also correlated with uh, population sources when she did back trajectories um, there. And um, so what we do here is we, we use the 11 stations where she had the data and dry and wet data. She had 313 independent observations. And so we run the model for the exact time period and, and pull the, you know, sub pull it for that week or that month, whatever it was, we at the exact location where the observations were made. And um, then we, you know, so we have the sources that we assume um, in the model, or we, we partially calculate the dust sources and the sea salt sources. Um, and so really we're using the model to get a source receptor relationship uh, for 313 observations. We're using um, a particular version of the model that um, has uh, bigger sizes, basically, that um, Maria and um, Toshi and Matsuba had put together. We use six different bins. Um, so these are much bigger than we usually use for, for our dust simulations. Um, and um, then um, we still don't quite know how to model the, those really funny looking. I mean, the particles are okay. We can, we, we know their density. We, you know, put them at the right density in the model. Uh, the density of, of plastics tend to be about the same as water, for example, which is less than dust. Um, but how in the world do we take care of those weird, funny looking particles? So, um, uh, you know, I'm going back to papers, you know, by um, 73 papers uh, talking about how ice crystals have, uh, fall. And, you know, how, how am I supposed to, to model this? It's, it's not as cute even as an ice crystal. They, I mean, they're very crystalline um, structures there, but they, they tend to fall just much slower than they would have were they spherical, okay? So um, what we decided to do, and we didn't know exactly how, how to do that, we, we decided to um, use three different size distributions for the fibers. So it turns out that about 95% of the mass is in the fibers. Um, so we can do both the particles and the fibers, but the fibers are really driving the whole problem. And here's our fiber length, right? It's, it's really quite big. Um, and then here's the particle size here, the observed particle size. So we put this into the model with three different size distributions, a bigger size, a medium size, and a small size. And we just postulate how those, um, you know, uh, that they would fall less fast, basically, um, from the dry depositional process. And so, um, so we're going to look at, you know, three different size distributions in terms of what they give us for an answer as some of the sensitivity studies we do, because we're really just not quite sure how fast these are going to fall. So we've got the sources, we've got the model, assuming some size distributions, forcing the deposition um, for each source to match the size distribution we're observing. So that's how we decide for each source what, what we're going to get. Um, then we do an optimal estimation to get a, a one source strength, basically, for each of them. So we allow the you know all the source to go up and down. So we'll end up with. Um, five numbers then that we're optimally estimating for. Um, and so we're using um, a particular approach because we have no a priori information about any of these sources really. Um, so we're using a particular approach which allows us to identify the 95% confidence limits. And so, um, and what we had to do was iterate kind of between the a priori errors that we're assuming the model data comparison has to the posteriori errors uh, to make sure that we, they're consistent basically. 
Um, and so we do a little bit of iteration to try to figure out what the errors, the a priori errors are, um, because we don't quite know what they are even, right? And we're making all sorts of assumptions about the sources. So that, that way we can get a robust estimate of the 95th percent confidence limits. And we're really, for this analysis, we're focusing just on what's happening in the Western United States. We also do a whole bunch of sensitivity studies, whatever we can do, excluding each side, excluding well, using only annual averages, including um, an initial best estimate from Evangelo. We do have one source that we have a best estimate for different ocean distribution. So we, we mess around with it a little bit to try to um, figure out where the largest errors are. Um, and, and this is basically what we get for the contribution at the measurement sites in the Western US here. So there's the percent contribution to the deposition at these sites. And the most important source is the roads. So the, this black um, triangle here is the medium. Then we've got the diagonal um, or the diamond is the big and the small is here. So you can see that those, you know, the differences in our size distribution gives us answers as well within the 95th percent confidence. Um, intervals that we, we got. So that the, the size doesn't matter that much for constraining that the, the road tire source um, is about 90% of the contribution at these sites. Then uh, the ocean source shows up as a, as a small but non-zero um, uh, with a really big uncertainty contribution. The ag does that, that really starts to depend on the size. The ocean source starts to depend on the size there. We get almost no dependence on the, the dust downwind from the population and a zero contribution from the population. Um, so, um, you know, this is what our optimal estimation gives us uh, here. And, and you can see the big error bars. And then there's a whole bunch of sensitivity studies that we also did, for example, removing one site and our, our confidence intervals get, you know, larger um, or using the annual average. So, um, we're getting a lot of information because there's not just one, you know, one value of deposition, which is what most people have reported before, but, but that the, we have, you know, uh, weekly values of, of deposition. So the, the seasonal cycle gives you information because of course it's sampling air from different regions. So this is then the, the picture we get um, in, in the Western US that, um, so here before I was showing you the contribution at the deposition sites. Now we're looking at the budget over the Western US. And um, you're seeing that the, the model thinks that there's, I'm not really sure what this is. Um, <laughs> there's a big black spot here and I'm not, let me, let me see if it goes away. No, huh, yeah, I'm sorry. This slide has been corroded here somehow, but about 11% contribution from sea spray. Um, and uh, you know, 84% over the Western US from road and braking emissions, soil, ag soil emissions are 5%. Um, and, and nothing coming directly from, from population centers. Although if you think about it, there's a lot more roads in population centers. So it, the model might not be able, well, it might prefer the road and braking source to the population center. Um, so it might already be captured. Um, let's see, I already went over the sensitivity studies here. So just to take a look at what the distributions look like. So this is the Western US and I don't have the coast of Mexico here. Um, uh, and these are you know, the different sites we have and you can see the state boundaries. Um, and this is the annual average you can get for the model deposition versus the observations here. Um, and you know, they really are in remote regions. Then um, you can see that if you look at each of the individual 313 sites, um, there is a lot of spread. There is a lot that we could do to improve the, the simulations here. But maybe we're on the right planet. Maybe. Not, not super confident. We have a lot of error bars here. Um, and so this is what it looks like if you look at the annual average. So if we just plot this up. And, and again, it doesn't, you know, doesn't tell me that we're doing a great job with the model. There's no R squared, that's statistically significant there. Um, so here you can see uh, like what the road source looks like and you can see, you know, it's, it's a little bit smoothed out. Um, and that, you know, that's why the model likes the road source because you can see that the, the deposition to these different sites is, does not have a strong gradient. It's gotta be something kind of diffuse as a source and there's roads everywhere. Um, and the, the ocean source, of course, 
is concentrated on the ocean and our sites are really far inland. So obviously there's a huge uncertainty on the ocean source and we're really speculating wildly about that. And so we were very excited when that Allen et al paper came out showing um, a little bit of evidence that there could be an ocean source. There's our ag dust source and, and our population dust source and the population source is zero. So it makes no contribution. Um, so, I mean, the good thing about um, this study is it has remote sites. So we're really talking about the deposition into remote regions. The bad part is um, it's really hard to get uh, the deposition right in these remote sites with a lot of topography. Um, it's, it's really hard to get right. So you take a look at you know, the errors in the model observation comparison for the dust of the sea salts and it, it, it's pretty big and you know maybe not as big as this but it's still pretty big so it's really hard to do the atmospheric modeling in, in these remote regions even if then we know what's going on in remote regions a little bit more we're dominated by the contribution from the road um, and um, and uh, well, this is it's just a detail of the way the optimization works is we're going to actually try to get more of a median observation than the mean because of the um, optimal estimation. So we've done this optimal estimation on the best data set that we have, um, uh, even if it's inadequate and we don't really understand the sources very well, did, did the numbers make any sense? Um, so the tire braking source is um, the most documented. We actually have a document of that. Um, and we're actually smaller than published, but within their uncertainty range. And, and they really weren't sure what fraction of the, um, those microplastics um, are, are long range transported. And all we're looking at is the long range transported fraction of it. Um, and, and in order to compare with them, of course, um, we actually have to extend our numbers globally because they're, they're estimate um, was a global estimate with almost no comparison to observation. So it wasn't really um, locally generated, although they, they use some observations from um, Europe to do the emission estimates. So it might be more heavily European based than ours. Now our ag dust concentration, so we can take, you know, what our ag source, uh, what our um, microplastics from ag dust source was, and then um, take an anthropogenic dust source estimate, say from Paul Janot for the Western US. And we can get a range of, you know, what kind of concentrations of microplastics there should be in the surface soil in agricultural, uh, in agricultural regions. And um, it, it is within the huge uncertainty in the limited observations we have. Okay, could be okay. Now our ocean source, um, our best estimate is about eight teragrams per year, but it's between zero and 22 teragrams per year. And it's really very poorly observed by the observational sites that we have. So very uncertain. I mean, just for reference, the black carbon emissions from humans is about 10 teragrams per year. Okay, so this, this would be huge if, if this were true. As I said, it's, you know, we can take a look at what was going on in the Allen et al study and they see microplastics coming in. And if we look at our concentrations at that same site for the same um, time period that they were there, um, uh, our our estimates in the model are two orders of magnitude lower than what they observed. So uh, we, we might be too low. Uh, anyway, right. Um, okay, maybe, maybe the source is, is this big or, or bigger or maybe not. Um, there, there's no um, data downwind of uh, polluted areas where there's microplastics coming off of them. Um, we, we don't have that. So if we, if we extend this globally and, and get the budgets, we see that, right, we have this, the road source here with the, the air bars. Um, and so this is for our, our best case, these are our sensitivity studies. You can see that the ocean source is really sensitive about our assumptions in size and, and has this huge air bar, goes from zero to 22 um, teragrams per year. Ag dust could be big, could not be, um, the dust downwind of population centers. And, and again, you know, the, Population centers are, are zero, basically, in, in the model. Um, so that the, the roads seem to take care of that source. Now, our, our road source is smaller than Evangelou, um, but it could be because the US doesn't put plastics into the asphalt that, that um, makes the roads, where they do do that in Europe, where those studies took place. So it might actually be a little bit different in different regions. Um, so. It could be errors in our model data comparison. It could be errors in our source. Um, but, but we really don't know what fraction is airborne um, to the remote regions I mean, is what Evangelou et al. argued. So 
it, it's unclear if we're um, consistent or not with them, or if we should be because of the, the difference in, you know, the microplastics in the road itself. So this is what um, we then say the modeled microplastic deposition is. Um, and so it's really concentrated in the oceans because the ocean <laughs> microplastics come up and go right back down again. These microplastics do not have a long lifetime. Um, they're pretty big, so they're just coming up and going down. And so there's actually a net flux of ocean source microplastics onto land here. Now, of course, all those microplastics must have come from the land at some point, but they could have been riverine or it could, have, could be you know, some fraction of the, the land sources are going through the atmosphere into the ocean as well. Um, um, there is a little bit of other data um, using number, numbers instead of mass um, there. And um, so here we, we're taking a look at that and maybe we're on the same planet. I'm not gonna argue too much about that. We spatially extrapolate, you know, the road source is big in the industrialized regions. The ocean source um, is, is the biggest in the Pacific because the Van Sibyl distribution really accentuates that, um, you know, uh, because that's where they, they measured so many of what they call microplastics, but are a bigger size distribution than we have. The agricultural dust um, is much smaller in the U.S. than elsewhere, so, you know, there, there would be better place to look for agricultural dust microplastics than the United States. And of course, it would be really dependent on whether they have microplastics in their um, fertilizer that they put on the, the, um, uh, the agricultural fields. And then here would be our population dust. So again, this is very poorly sampled by, in the, by the Western US um, where we have the data. Um, we did some sensitivity studies about the ocean and they're, they're really not very sensitive about the ocean details here. Um, it, and the amount of, um, uh, of ocean microplastics that we have, um, that, we, that, that we're deducing in the ocean is, um, uh, you know, with, which is a different size uh, distribution, of course. Um, but here is the observed plastics from the Van Sibyl. And, and you can see that, that we had to completely change the bar here, that, that we are postulating much less microplastics than they observed in the slightly larger size fraction. So very plausible. What we're, what we're speculating is very plausible in comparison to the limited observations. Um, and here's some budgets. Um, the, the road sources are, are most likely most important across all different regions. So here's the US, the source, the deposition, Africa, um, here, the um, agricultural dust could be more important, you know, but it's really dependent on how many microplastics are in the agricultural soils. Um, Asia, right? So, you know, here we're taking data from Western US where we actually have constrained it and then we're extrapolating wildly to the rest of the world. Not, not sure how much, you know, you, you should take this um, <laughs> with a very large grain of salt here, um, but this is what that extrapolation would, would lead us to think. So what, what are the impacts? Um, uh, you know, you hear about microplastics a lot in the papers. Um, and, um, you know, when we submitted our paper, we said, you know, microplastics are likely to cause um, impacts on humans and ecosystems. And the reviewers are like, we don't know that. <laughs> you have to tone that down. So likely isn't even, okay, we had to say something like, it's possible microplastics cause damage to humans or ecosystems. It's just really not that much information about their potential impacts. Um, it, it does seem like something we should try to get a handle on. I mean, if right now in remote regions, you got 2% of your deposition, is microplastics and it's possible things are going to go up by a factor of 10 in the next 20, 30 years because of the increase in um, mismanaged plastics, possible, maybe not, you know, it, that's 20%. And at that point, you really want to know what, what you're doing. So try to try to nip this one in the bud if we can. Um, there's a little bit of evidence that it reduces crop productivity. Again, you know, just three studies impact natural ecosystems and higher trophic system levels. There's just a couple of studies looking at that. Human impacts, um, the, the smaller particles here, which is not most of what we were looking at, could get into your lungs and any kind of insoluble particle in your lung is, is not very good for it. Or ingested, it could be bad. Climate impacts, the, the Rebel et al. study, 
um, uh, estimated an extremely small radiative forcing, which is totally consistent with what we did. I, I didn't even publish the AODs because you, you can't see the AODs from the microplastics in comparison to any other uh, aerosol source. Um, it's a super small number. And, and they, they probably underestimated because they didn't have an ocean um, microplastic source there. So um, they probably underestimated the my, uh, microplastics in the um, atmosphere, maybe by 10 or 100 fold, but it still doesn't matter. It's, it's probably not important for um, climate effects. Now, it could be important for ice nucleation effects because they, they are a little bit crystalline um, and they could have snow or ice impacts. Um, and Ravel et al. assumed basically they were kind of clear um, plastics. And of course, some of the plastics are actually black. So um, especially for snow or ice, they could have a, a bigger impact. Well, solutions, I mean, and people are really thinking about different ways of cutting plastics and, and plastic pollution. Here's just one estimate of, you know, business as usual, and but we could flatten it out. Um, those would be things that we could do for, especially macro plastics, um, try to reduce them into ecosystem. There's a lot of studies about this, about how one might try to change the ecosystem impacts here. I'm just showing you a couple. Um, but one of the, the things is, 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 is a lot of times the ecosystems are, are targeting the macroplastics, the big ones you can see. And like I said, it's not at all clear if the macroplastics degradation is causing the microplastics or not. Are we directly emitting the microplastics? So, for example, um, my collaborators were saying that one of the really easy ways to get con um, controls, you know, samples of microplastics is to wash your fleece jacket, okay? So that the microplastics could be generated in laundry, getting into the wastewater, getting all the way out to the oceans and coming back in that way, not, not having anything to do with macroplastics at all. Um, saying it could be coming out the, the smokestacks from laundries or something. We, we don't know where the microplastics are coming from at this stage. So they could be completely disconnected from the macroplastic problem. And we haven't talked about the nanoplastics at all. There isn't a way to observe anything less than four microns. And you could just imagine that those could be the most dangerous of these and even more, you know, a lot of mass and, and the small size fraction that could travel much farther um, and, uh, you know, interfere a little bit more with the atmosphere or with ecosystems because they, you know, are smaller and can get, you know, for example, into um, your lungs a little easier or into uh, um, human um, uh, systems like you know, the brain, the brain boundary, the brain blood boundary and things like that. All speculation at this point. So um, what I've talked about is, you know, really using the Bernie et al. Um, observations that um, they put together in an amazing data set, try to um, see how we can model the deposition in remote regions from long range transport. I mean, it's great that it's long range transport, so it's remote. So we have some sense of what's really flowing long range, but it's really hard to model what's happening in, in going into these remote um, mountainous regions. We model for the same period and we're, we kind of speculate what the sources could be and then deduce the size of the sources through optimal estimation um, using a source receptor kind of relationship. What we find is, is really uh, the resuspension of microplastics could be really important. The ocean source, of course, would be resuspension of microplastics through the you know, sea, sea spray um, aerosol mechanism. Dust agricultural resuspension could be really important. And, and we think you know, that there's good arguments to say that just the degradation of the tires or the roads can emit um, plastics, but they wouldn't explain all these pink and blue plastics, which was, you know, a large fraction, but I'm not saying anything statistical there, but a large fraction um, anecdotally of what they were seeing in the observations here. So th those can't be tires, that has to be other plastics. Um, so that could be the resuspension off the roads again into the atmosphere. Really what we need is way more observational locations, more, and um, the temporal resolution turned out to be really valuable in trying to understand the source um, and the receptor uh, relationship. And you know, anytime we're doing anything really close to the coast here, we're trying to understand if the land is providing microplastics to the ocean or the ocean to the land, it's really sensitive to, um, to the resolution of the coast. Um, and so in a lot of ways, we, we ended up with um, more questions than answers, I would say, uh, on this problem. So you know, in the future, we really need to understand, you know, should we worry about microplastics? Um, and, and we need the data for the, the smaller, anything smaller than four micron, we, we really don't have a good, a good way to observe it right now in the system. 
we, we could actually use information about the polymer type to figure out the original plastic sources because uh, you know really in this study all we've done is said what was the, the last source uh, to the to be positive it doesn't tell you what plastic it came from or the original source of the mismanaged plastic but you could use polymer types to figure that out so that is something that we do have information uh, about we didn't have it in in um, this study but um, that is something we can figure out so we, we could do a little bit better with that and then of course we, we'd like to look at the climate impacts and chemistry impacts and see um, whether it's impacting the atmosphere or whether you know if it were tenfold larger it would impact the atmosphere so I uh, again I'd like to say that I think um, our study um, uh, raises more questions than it um, resolves um, but it, it was a really interesting um, new problem to work on and I find it fascinating to work on new problems and try to figure out what, what are the observations really telling us and what can we constrain from that thank you thanks Dr. Mahold um yeah, I'm surprised that there hasn't really been a lot of work done on atmospheric microplastics, considering how prevalent we know that they are um, in the oceans at this point. Um, so yeah, definitely super interesting and super important work. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for coming to speak about it. Um, so if anybody has any questions for Dr. Mahowald, you can either unmute yourself or you can type it into the chat. Um, we We'll give it a few minutes um, to, to answer questions and then we'll wrap up. Uh, hi, Joe Prospero here. I have a question. Am I on? I can't see whether. Yep, I can hear you, yes. Joe. Oh, okay, good. Uh, Natalie, uh, uh, thank you. Very nice. Uh, it's uh, This will carry you well into retirement. So <laughs> when you're my age, uh, You'll still be working on the plastics, I think. But you, you, uh, you addressed one issue that I've uh, been curious about well before the microplastics issue came up. And you mentioned it briefly. That had to do with uh, emissions from clothes dryers. I mean, there must be huge amounts of stuff, aerosols in general, but uh, of all types, coming out of clothes dryers. And I don't recall ever seeing any detailed study or estimates of what is coming out of clothes dryers. Uh, you know, since I'm retired, I do laundry occasionally. And, uh, and the thing that strikes me is that the dryer filter really picks up a lot of stuff. And of course, that's an extremely crude filter that picks up only gross stuff. So there must be a huge amount of material going out. And uh, so are you aware of any studies of what is coming out of clothes dryers? No, we, that was our, that was our, like, what's coming out of clothes dryers, you know, that, yeah. that was our first speculation or washers. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're very anecdotal with no quantitative numbers. I've had several people contact me, though, how, how to do that, <laughs> how to measure that. So I think people will, are looking at it now. Um, okay, I think the last good. two years, there's been a lot of publicity about the issue. And, and more and more people are taking a look at these different sources. So. Yeah, good, good. Thank you. It looks like um, Dr. Clement has a question. Hey, hey, Amy. Nat hey, Natalie, thank you so much. I'm just um, like so impressed of how you can over and over take on these problems that are so uncertain and um, and use the model as an incredible tool to at least like frame the questions better and um, and figure, you know, and help guide the guide the research going forward. Thank oh, you. Thank for, you. Amy. And, That's such a nice thank, thing to say. Yeah. Well, thank, and thank you. you for working on this problem because, wow, um, scary. Um, and uh, my question was, um, you know, it seems like there's lots of filters, dust filters out there, like with the whole, like all the, you know, global dust modeling. Could we be getting um, global data on what the uh, on what the distribution of these plastics are in those filters? Is it already like are, are is it already out there and that we um, just have to start looking? You have to, of course, use some filters. And I'm gonna, you, you know, how good of a observationalist I am. So I'm already embarrassed. Okay, we got <laughs> Joe and Cassie on here, but yeah. um, I, I I think you can't use quartz filters or something that's super common okay. because the microplastics stick to it. You can only use certain, or you can't use Teflon too. Anyway, you okay. have to use a certain kind of filter. Okay, um, but there is a, a paper. 
that's um, we, we had a workshop, you know, it, uh, it was a kind of a dust um, based uh, Gazamp workshop. If you, if you remember those Bob Deuce and um, Tim Jickles, we just had a, a workshop on how to measure microplastics and a paper is going to come out um, proposing the, the networks that are needed and, and which data that we can already use and which can't. Um, but I, but I would say, um, yeah, only in the but last few years have anybody been trying to figure any of this stuff out. And, and there's every month there's new papers coming out. So hopefully we'll have right. more information. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and that's tricky to yeah. observe though. Right. And then, and we still don't have something for the nanoplastics um, is the problem that you have to go, I guess you can't tell the difference between the, the like cotton fibers and the plastic fibers, unless you do the FTIR and it's almost on a particle by particle basis at this point. I'm super painful. Um, okay. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I, I think that's that's going to be a horrendous problem because there the, there are no standard techniques. There, there can't be a standard technique given the huge diversity of the particle types. So it's going to be a mess, a real mess. You're never going to see numbers like you see for PM two, PM two point five, PM ten, and the gross dust numbers that you see and things like that. There won't be such simple numbers to play with, unfortunately. Okay, I think um, Bikita Zaidema has a question next. Uh, yeah, I um, I can't turn on my video, otherwise I would show my face. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the wonderful talk. I, uh, I was wondering about the life cycle of these microplastics, like how long do people expect them to hang around? Does UV light degrade those so they eventually go away? Could we just like change our plastics um, composition to make these less um, so that so they don't live as long as they do yeah and and you could see like some of the intro there, there's that Roland Geyer um, paper all about that trying to change the, the lifetime of the, the plastics um, and, and manipulate that and um, that, I mean there's lots of ideas of course not using oil and gas to generate them, but instead using you know, bio source plastics and things like that to try to make their lifetimes shorter. Um, and there is a lot of literature there. And, and you would think in the atmosphere, right, they would degrade a little bit faster because of UV, but these, these don't have that long of a lifetime in the atmosphere. And then, you know, we're thinking kind of they get resuspended <laughs> um, and move along. Um, and, uh, but you would think they would degrade um, the one interesting thing that we were looking at is just how long some of these might last in the ocean. And it turns out under ocean conditions, they'll last longer <laughs> um, because they're wet and colder um, and, you know, not so much UV, UV light. And so um, that's all I can say. We, we took a look at the lifetimes and the atmospheric lifetime is way shorter than any of these lifetimes. So we don't think the chemical decay in the atmosphere is the most important part. So. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, I missed that in your intro. Oh no, I, I didn't. I didn't talk about that too much. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Natalie, I think we can also say, you know, if you're able to come down to Miami in early May, I'm confident that um, you work with so many people in our department. We can. We'll. We'll find a way to support that because oh, it would that be great sounds to like fun. Visit. that sounds like fun thanks Vicky. cassie yeah it's a really great talk as always natalie um so yeah i'm just kind of curious like for thinking about the deposition problem i mean I, I feel like an obvious route might be to think about um just trying extracting some of these microplastics and different solvents to get the density right and then to like maybe take some of Janice's data and try to look at the aspect ratio just to get the settling velocity um, a little bit more hammered down. I don't know if anyone's thought about that approach or is um, there, or if that some, approach wouldn't work because they're just so diverse. There, there's some papers under review that I have seen that are going to do a better job than we did with this, right? I mean, we just like, I don't know. Uh, um, yeah. So they're, they're trying to calculate it a little better. So I do think you can do better. I also have a colleague here who's got a wind tunnel who can calculate the settling velocity. So we're trying to get him some money um, uh, to, to do this kind of work. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we just need more, <laughs> more information about them. And, and they are, well, the fibers, you know, are, 
are pretty thin and long, right? So yeah. they're not all heterogeneous, right? Now, some of the plastics can be broken little bits, and then you get a little more heterogeneous. Um, but what they did was a, kind of a really detailed study to figure out, you know, whether there were big air pockets in the middle of them and, and things like that um, to get the density um, from, from the ones that they looked at when they, you know, picked them out um, and looked at them. So um, there, there is some of that data already, but I, I think more and more is going to come out really soon. I hope so. I mean, I, I would suspect that atmospheric lifetime or a part of the life cycle is actually a lot longer than, than what we think. And that there, there's probably room for a lot of degradation in the atmosphere, a lot more than what we, we suspect at the moment. Well, you know, the, the chemical lifetime is 30 years for some of these, okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not, not chemical, what I, what I mean is like just the lifetime in the atmosphere, like just how long they stay suspended in the, in the air is what I mean, yeah. not, the, not the chemical. So, so one also thing to point out, oh, and now I'm going to forget, but um, the model deposition, the squares are one thing and the triangles are something else. Oh, this is the dry deposition and this is the wet deposition. And you can see that the model is under predicting the wet deposition and over predicting the dry deposition. So yeah. to me, that's consistent with a fiber gets hit by, you know, water droplets going to come down more than you would think, but to settle slower. So, I mean, it's a quick and easy thing in our model to actually do it differently, right? For the, the wet and the dry deposition. So they're not the same sphere <laughs> there. So that, I think that was what would be what we would, we could do really quickly. There. Thanks. As always, your modeling work always just provides experimentalists with some really good <laughs> food for thought. So thank you. Oh, uh, thanks a lot, Cassie. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. There's some, um, there's one more, Altug, I think. Yeah. Yes. So, hi, this is Altu Oxoy. And, you know, I come uh, from a completely different background. I'm an atmospheric scientist and I work, um, you know, across the street from uh, Rasmus over at AOML. Um, so, you know, I, I, but nevertheless, I'm kind of taken, I was kind of uh, taken aback by the dominance of the roads as a source. Uh, you know, I, I before your talk, I never imagined the roads to be, you know, the major source. But then if you think about it, you know, uh, there is direct contact between tires and the road. And, and, and obviously friction should directly result in, um, you know, plastics as a source. And in that sense, maybe I'm not that sur surprised then that uh, roads outside of the cities may be a bigger source because, you know, you're driving at, at, at higher speeds. And of course, friction is quadratically dependent on, on speed itself. So perhaps outside the cities, um, you know, roads become a bigger source than the cities themselves. Uh, but then it, if I take this further, then I also think could airports become a major source because now you're actually you know um you know at least doubling perhaps even quadrupling the speed the contact and then that becomes uh you know that results in uh, even bigger friction and po possibly um you know uh, a, a source. Um, so I, I, you know, I thought there could probably be more room to model this in, in greater detail if you, if you wanted to as a kind of as a function of average speed or something like that. Right. I mean, the only thing about airports, it, my, my first thought, I mean, you're right, they'll go faster, but the miles traveled is much smaller. Um, right. So I think that's why it's, it's not included. So, you know, other people did that analysis and, it's kind of a mass balance analysis that the tire w uh, road wear, right? They just, uh, here's how big the tires were before. And then after use, they're this big. And that right. means this mass came off, okay? Um, but, but, and so that's what some of those budget numbers are. You just don't know if it comes off as microplastics or bigger pieces. So, sure. Um, so that's, that's where it is. Um, and uh, so I just, I'm not convinced that airplanes would be bigger in that case, um, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, certainly the, the game people who, who do those kind of modeling, um, I can ask. Yeah, that's just fascinating stuff. Thank you so much.
Great. Um, well, thank you again to Dr. Mahowald for coming to speak today. I think we all found your your talk very enlightening and, and obviously very, very important. So um, we really appreciate you coming and sharing with us. Oh, um, thanks so much for having me. Oh, and hi, Lisa. I didn't see you there. <laughs> hi, Natalie. Nice <laughs> to see you. Nice to see you, too. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, Bye -bye. great to see. Thanks, thanks Natalie. Natalie. Come, come visit Miami. Uh, yes. Oh, you must come to Miami. Yeah. And not in May. It should be now. <laughs> I know. I know. Can I, I think I want to postpone and come, you know, in person sometime in the yeah. winter. <laughs> but I'll see you guys. All right. Okay. Bye-bye.